morning, Tri-Cities. It's Friday, 9 o'clock, so it's time for Coffee with Carl. I'm Carl Dye from Tridec, and we have got a great webinar in stock for everybody today. Uh, we are super excited and pleased to be joined by our Tri-Cities Airport team. I'll introduce them in no particular order, starting with Jack Penning, the managing partner from Volair Aviation. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. Good to see you. I appreciate the TWA colors. Absolutely. Got it back, uh, St. Louis, right? <laughs> That's true. Hey, <laughs> you know, the best airlines are the ones that are nostalgic and probably can't um, cancel your flight anymore. <laughs> Good point. And last but definitely not least, our own Buck Taft, the director of the Tri Cities Airport. Good morning, Buck. Good morning, Carl. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Good. So wonderful to see you. It's always great to see you, Buck. <laughs> well, we got to start off with uh, our sponsor. That's Mike Miller from Moon Security. Mike and his team at Moon Security do such a great job for our community. Huge community supporters. As you can see from the video, I think that was probably Buck's house, you know, with that smart home stuff in it. Uh, but Moon Security can integrate to, to clearly smart home features, um, personal and also corporate uh, security, they're the leaders here. Go see Mike and his team downtown Pasco. Thanks, Mike Miller, for your sponsorship of Coffee with Carl. Okay, let's get into the mugs. I've got a huge surprise. This will come uh, really as a big shock for you guys, but I have a mug from the best airport in the world. And I have to say that I've, I'm not a world traveler like Jack uh, or even Buck, but it's amazing to show up at our airport at 4.30 in the morning that I can get to in 20 minutes because there's no traffic on the road and, you know, get right through security, walk to the gate, get on the plane. And it's, it's never failed me. I've been flying out of the airport for four years now. And that's why I say it's the best. It's the customer service is great. TSA is great. I think we have the best TSA agents and I'll just give a shameless plug for the Tri-Cities airport and uh, Buck and his team that do such a great job. That's my mug. Well, thanks, but let's not tell everybody how easy it is because there are times when you need to be here over an hour before your flight. And yeah. Because people do miss their flights because they try to show up like Carl does five minutes before and they can't check their bag. They can't get through the security line. So there are times of the day where we do have lines at security and lines to check your bags. And um, so, That's true. you know, if you know the system and you can work it, great, but some people don't, and I don't want to give the idea that you can get here 20 minutes before your your flight like Carl, but it is a great small little airport, and I feel we're pretty efficient. We have good customer service. TSA is great, but there are times of the day that are really busy. Um, so, Very well said, Buck, and I, I totally agree with that. I always plan on being there one hour before the flight starts because that's, that's the way to go. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> he well, gets there 10 minutes before we know the truth but that's okay <laughs> i always make it on the plane uh buck what do you have for a mug for us well you know um i do not drink coffee so i do not drink out of a mug but i have right. two today i have my celsius tropical vibe because that's what i want to have today is a nice tropical vibe and then i have my half gallon of water Right. That Super tanker. Yes. Yeah. That's a tropical vibe. That's that's so fitting and appropriate, Buck. Yeah. To be honest, it was the only one in the refrigerator this morning. So <laughs> that's what I get. <laughs> well, and I, I appreciate your dedication to drinking and hydrating like that. That's super tanky. Yeah, that's a that's amazing. I'm yeah. really proud of you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Jack, how about you? Do you have a mug or something? Oh, I share? do. I have an actual mug. If yeah. you can see that, it's Brussels, Belgium. Oh, yeah. That that's, goes with my shirt because when I was a kid, I grew up in Brussels, Belgium, and I always flew back and forth in the wow. 1980s on TWA. Wow. So I wanted to have the full travel theme today. That's how right. I really got into aviation was, you know, when I was a kid, I was flying across the ocean like three and four times a year back wow. and forth on TWA L-1011, somebody will remember that plane. They've been retired for 25 years now, but um, th th this mug always reminds me of those great trips on TWA and I miss it to this day. Wow. What, so I have to ask, like, what? why were you in Belgium? So my dad worked over there and, oh. and so that's where I grew up. Um, okay. 
just how it worked out. The family all moved to, to Belgium and that's where I grew up. So we can do this en français, s'il vous plaît. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or we can stick in English either way. Well, let's just play it safe and stick with English, but okay. <laughs> uh, so we're going to start off. I, I, I'll welcome everybody to our webinar. Um, if you have any questions for Jack and Buck as we go along, you can ask the questions. If you're joining us on Zoom with the question feature that we have turned on, if you're on social media, you can post on social media and we'll do our best to get to all the questions that we have. But Jack, you want to kick us off with your awesome slides. I, I always appreciate the data that you put together and we actually use it in a lot of other things. Like when you talk about our catchment area, we use it when we go to the retail trade show and we just say, well, Jack said we have a million in our catchment area. So that clearly applies to retail as well. True, U.S. Census data, it tells us the truth. You draw your polygons and it tells you how many people are there. I, I, you know, I know it's early as a Friday, everybody's going into the weekend, so I don't want to get too crazy, but I do have information that I think is valuable to share. So I'm, I'm going to share it. Yes, um, please. It, it, it's just, you know, we've seen this airport is just doing so well. Um, that That's the bottom line. And we've seen such growth and it, it not all, you know, Volair Aviation, we represent clients all over the country, all over the world. And we have very few airports with the kind of success that we've seen in the Tri-Cities over the last several years. And then you go back. I've been a consultant in the Tri-Cities for 20 years now. And when I started, um, you know, we essentially had four routes and, you know, we were lucky to have 200,000 people a year using the airport. And now we've got more than four times that. So, um, you know, what you're looking at is our current service. And we looked at the schedule for the fall. Um, we're going to have 13% more seats than we had last fall. What this means, we, well, the big thing I want to point out, we, Buck and Carl and I have been working on this for years, was getting Alaska Airlines to fly nonstop every day to LAX. It, it, we traveled to Seattle. We've met with them. They've come to the Tri-Cities. We worked and worked and worked and worked, and it felt like we were banging our head against the wall. But this multi-year recruitment has resulted in service that starts in October to LAX. We'll have flights every single day, leaving in the morning. Um, nice three-class big jet going down to LAX, connects to everywhere in Mexico, connects to some of the Hawaiian destinations. And then every evening plane coming back from LAX that comes back from Cabo and from Puerto Verde and from all of those great places that you know people want to travel um and it just goes to show you that air service development which is what I do and a lot of people are probably surprised there's even such an industry uh but developing new routes at airports is very difficult we, we get a lot of misconceptions that um the airport can choose what routes the airlines fly and that couldn't be further from the truth. We are merely a public utility, essentially, that the airlines can serve as they choose. So in virtually all of the cases of the, the dots on this map, we've had to do a lot of work to get the airlines to fly to those cities. Uh, and it's work that never ends. The other new service that's operating uh, now is American is in the market now. Um, we started meeting with American almost 20 years ago to try and convince them to come to the Tri-Cities. And Buck and I traveled to Dallas. We met them in conferences all over the country, kept building the business case for service. And now we have American flying every day to Phoenix. Um, and we have other routes that we want to recruit, and I'll show you those a little bit later. But we'll have an average of 19 flights leaving every single day uh, this fall about 1,700 seats leaving and coming back every single day. So that's um, the highest level of capacity that the market has ever had. So the work has paid off. And I think it, it says a lot, because I know, Carl, you put a lot of emphasis on this for the community. And Buck, you put a ton of emphasis on developing air service, and it really does pay off. I mean, we were on the very first flight to Burbank, the three of us together. You know, they were we didn't necessarily have to all be jammed into that one row, but... You know, I'm the little guy, so I was just squeezed against the window. Uh, <laughs> but, I think it was awesome, know. and I, I I, still am excited for that flight. I think it's, you know, I mean, we've all flown through LAX, and it's great. And getting the Alaska flight, as you said, Jack, huge accomplishment. But 
that of Hello Flight into Burbank, depending on where you're going, it's it's pretty convenient. And I, that's I one it. of the, out of all the comments I get um, from the public, the LAX or Burbank has is the top of the, the list of, I'm glad you got that flight. Uh, I really like the Avello service. Burbank's great. So it's the community start is, is using it. And they're, they're very aware of it. So it does very, very well um, about, well, all of our routes are doing very well. Everything is profitable. Um, Avello among the best performers. And I would note, we now have six airlines flying to the Tri-Cities. That's pretty remarkable for a community of the size of the Tri-Cities. Um, it, it just, doesn't happen very much and it doesn't happen without hard work. So if you look at this chart, these are the, the number of people using Tri-Cities Airport going all the way back to 2010. Best year ever in 2023, we had about 1,200 people a day departing from the airport. And we're gonna be probably closer to 1,400 people a day in 2024. So that shows you the continued growth. That number at the top is the number of people each day going in and then coming uh, going out and then coming back in and then the total passengers down below. So, um, Buck, I would ask you, you know, what are you forecasting for, for this year? We, you know, we're going to be close to a million here in the next couple of years. Yeah, right now we're up 10% year to date. <clears throat> so, um, it's, we're, we're going to be pushing that, um, 500,000 number. I don't know if we'll get it this year, but we're definitely going to be knocking on the the door of 500,000 employments. So about a million passengers um, total. Um, for us, what you feel, I mean, it's not significantly more than pre-COVID, but the way the passengers are now coming on the larger aircraft, you feel the pressure in the terminal building more than we did pre-COVID just because there's more people here at one time than there was pre-COVID um, as the airlines, which Jack will talk about later at kind of switched how they're they're operating and we're just a benefactor of the post-COVID um transition that the airlines have made. Where other airports are suffering, we're we're actually on the opposite end of the spectrum, which is is good for us. Yeah, I think it's the mix of traffic. We've got just a great mix of we still have significant business travel that's pretty much essential. Um, but we've got a huge mix of what is being termed as leisure travel business slash leisure where um people like me i i you know i work from from home i can live wherever i want i i you know they come to the tri cities they live there um they go on a trip to la for a meeting and they bring the family and stay the weekend we're seeing a ton of that kind of traffic where instead of getting one business traveler we've got four or five people traveling on that trip and that's been a huge benefit also if you look at the recovery from covid we we didn't really know if we're going to see a u recovery and take we if you draw a line from 2010 to where we are today we basically got back on our previous trajectory for total passengers in less than three years which is really remarkable. And that is not the case for most regional airports. That just hasn't happened. So um, it, it speaks to the economic strength of the Tri-Cities, of all of that part of Washington. Um, and it, it, it speaks to the kind of service we have to keep people from, from driving. Now, having said that, we did a new study to figure out in that catchment that we talk about, Carl, the area that we draw passengers from, how many are using Tri-Cities Airport? Only 32% of passengers in our area are using Tri-Cities Airport. 39% of our passengers are still driving to Seattle. So that's almost 5,000 people that we're losing every single day, every single day. Um, so we know we can support more service. I said, you know, we've got 19 departures a day on average this fall. We could support if everyone used tri-cities airport nobody drove to another airport we could support 40 departures every single day now buck doesn't have the room for that <laughs> as you know the airport would not be able to handle 40 departures a day but that's the market size and and actually our um retention has been falling so we were in the 40 percent, and now we're in the 30 because the market is growing faster than our air service even adding american and adding lax service that's coming in october we still don't have enough seats 
And that is absolutely remarkable because we've done some peer benchmarking in places like Medford and in Eureka, California and Bellingham, Washington and Wenatchee, Washington. And we're not seeing the overall market growth as quickly in those communities as we are seeing it in the Tri-Cities. Um, so this is great for us from an air service development perspective because we have a lot to talk to airlines about. There's a lot more opportunity here. Um, you know, and we're hopeful part of this um, our capacity gap will be um, filled in by larger aircraft. We already see seven uh, larger uh, 737s to Seattle. Um, we see larger aircraft to Salt Lake City. You're going to, over the next 12 to 18 months, see larger aircraft to places like Denver. Uh, and that will help us some. But so many people go to Seattle. More people drive to Seattle every day from the Tri-Cities to get on a plane than get on a plane at Tri-Cities Airport. So we, we really want to work on on improving well, and a that. A lot of that is not necessarily from the Tri-Cities, but the Tri-Cities catchment area, which is that west side of our catchment area, which is like the Yakima Valley. And the we've been spending a lot of time and effort in advertising and marketing in the Yakima Valley to bring awareness to what we are um we're we're trying to change habits um from people in Yakima going to Seattle. Um, a lot of um, folks in Yakima still think we're just like Yakima and only have Alaska. So we're trying to bring that awareness that we have all these airlines here. We have these different destinations. So we're putting the time and effort in to Yakima to try to get the majority of those folks to at least instead of flying out of Seattle, think about the Tri-Cities and, and come this way. So. Yeah, that is a part of that. And it really, we we are a regional hub in ways that are much bigger than just air service, right? And so everywhere we've got these cultural connections, we feel like we ought to be their airport. And I think that's important. And the, the more people that we can draw from the outlying areas, the more air service we can have. Now, there are a lot of headwinds that are pushing against us right now in terms of getting more flights. Um, the biggest one is delivery delays with both Boeing and Airbus. And you would think that, well, that we have mostly smaller aircraft that aren't Boeing and, and Airbus. I mean, they're all two class, three class jets, but the problem is this is putting pressure on fleets. So Boeing has dropped its deliveries with the, the 737 MAX issues. Airbus has dropped deliveries because of engine issues. So we have a gap of 500 planes that were supposed to be delivered in the US in the next two years that aren't going to be delivered. Airlines are still retiring planes. They don't have planes to backfill the ones they're retiring, which means they have to start cutting service. They just don't have enough. And, and that goes from the bottom up. So they start cutting the small planes. Those move up to the next one. Then where you know we've got the two class regional jets. Those get put into larger cities. You, know, you see those. Portland, Anchorage, Alaska is flying that partially with 76 seat regional jets this summer. Those planes should not be flying that route, but Alaska doesn't have enough 737s. So um, this has put a ton of pressure on our size of market. We've been able to um, continue well to support the service we have and not see any cuts because of it, but other communities have seen massive cuts. I mean, Walla Walla is down to two flights a day. Yakima is down to two flights a day. It's because of things like this. We also have a pilot shortage, but believe it or not, the aircraft delivery problem is helping with the pilot shortage because the major airlines have been sucking up all the pilots from the regional carriers and the regional carriers couldn't keep their their plane staffed and couldn't keep people flying to places like the tri-cities now with the delivery delays the majors have halted pilot hiring which means there's more pilots available for regional aircraft um, so that is helping the pilot training pop pipeline to catch up essentially over time. But we still, that blue number, that's that's the number of pilots we're gonna be short each year. So the pilot shortage still grows. We'll be about 14,000 pilots short of what's needed to fly the 2019 network by 2026, but it was gonna be about 25,000 pilots short uh, before the aircraft delivery day. Still 1,300 planes are gonna have to be parked by 2026. Um, that that's a huge number. That's about a tenth of the total fleet. Uh, so we're going to see additional communities lose air service. Uh, and, and that's another reason a, a lot of our job 
a lot of, well, what the three of us do is we're trying to retain the flights that we have today. Uh, and we are also trying to convince the carriers we can support larger planes because the carriers want each pilot hour to carry as many people as possible. And so the more people we can use or, or the more people we can carry with each hour and use those hours efficiently, the better off we're going to be. Um, we talked a little bit about how work has changed and that's changed how people travel. The left there, that's the share of remote work days. So we're still at about 30% of work days in this country are remote. Before the pandemic, it was 5%. So we didn't go back to full in office, um, and a lot of companies did not. 76% of earnings by workers are from remote workers. So remote, remote workers tend to generate more revenue for their companies. Um, it's really wild. So what has happened is that we've created a group of workers who can work from anywhere and often work from different places all the time. Uh, because we're we're doing these things, you know, on Zoom, webinars, meetings like this, you're seeing people who maybe would have been stuck in an office. This week, they're in LA. Next week, they're in Albuquerque. The week after that, they're in the Smoky Mountains. And then they're back in the Tri-Cities the week after that, generating a ton of new trips. So this actually has overcome the decline in business travel. So business travel spending right now is actually above where it was in 2019. Businesses are spending more on airline tickets than they did in 2019. But passengers, business travelers are down by 40%. So it shows you everybody's just spending a lot more per ticket. But this type of travel has made up the difference and now, uh, you know, passengers have have recovered almost to where they would have been. And our passengers are where they were forecast to be before the pandemic. So that's pretty remarkable. This is also the way that, that travel has changed has created a, a new, that new type of customer that new carriers have figured out how to go after. That's a Velo. We have a Velo in Allegiant that flying on the peak days of the week for the new type of passenger that's been created by remote work is now 14% of all seats being flown around the US. Where network carriers were 91% in 2010, they're only 74% of seats today. And we call them legacies. Those are network, but smaller. They're, they've grown too. Alaska has grown significantly. Alaska, of course, is purchasing Hawaiian Airlines. Um, that niche was 4% of seats in 2010, and now it's 12%. So these really smart carriers have been able to carve out new business plans based on how travel has changed. And we've done a good job of targeting those. Now, we don't have all of them, and we're still working to expand service on those other carriers. Um, but that's where really there's a lot of opportunity moving forward. Um, because with the network carriers... We just don't have many to talk to. I mean, you look at this chart. This goes back to 1980. You see my TWA guys on there, um, absorbed into American in 2001. Uh, but we basically have four airlines we can work with, and we have all four serving our airport, American, Delta, United, and Alaska. Southwest has experimented in smaller markets, and you probably saw they went into Bellingham, and they, they're leaving Bellingham in August. It didn't work out for them. Uh, so... Southwest is really not an option in a market of our size. The business model is difficult to uh, support with our population, but we have the other four. So there's no America West for us to go and get anymore. There's no U.S. Airways. There's no Virgin America. You know, we're limited. So we really do have to work with those low cost carriers on things like Burbank and things like getting to Las Vegas. That's our main option. So we still have things we want to recruit. And, and this is a map of a few of them that are high on a, our list. Uh, but we, you know, we hear a lot from the community. They, they want Portland back. And we're hopeful that as Alaska grows into the new terminal at Portland, that they will develop that hub and that will be an opportunity for us again. We've heard eastbound service, Dallas, Fort Worth, now that we have American, would be an excellent connecting hub, especially to places like Florida, the Caribbean. Um, Chicago has come up a ton. We know there's a lot of travel just to Chicago every day. We have 50 people a day each way that go to and from Chicago. 
um, Atlanta and Delta. Um, and, and, and then with low cost, less than daily seasonal, we do hear demand for places like Palm Springs, for places like Orange County. So as we look forward, um, this is what we're thinking of as our next targets. Knowing that LAX is starting and we've had a lot of success and we want to make sure everything is successful, but we do think as tr the Tri-Cities grows, we've got a lot of opportunity. Buck, is there anything you want to say about our, our targets here? No, I think that's accurate. Um, the two, well, the three that really come to mind that the community reaches to me, um, reaches out to me about is Portland, Chicago, and DFW. And, and I think out of all of them, I'm I'm most optimistic um, in the short term of DFW. Um, we'll see how this second flight does um, that Americans adding to to Phoenix, but I feel if that um, continues to be as successful as it is, it, it won't be long, and um, we'll probably have a, a DFW flight. Um, as far as the ultra low cost carriers, I think Palm Springs makes sense from a seasonal perspective, and. I think we would have a lot of traffic going to Palm Springs, but I think the issue is more in Palm Springs than in Pasco. I agree. And so, you know, that's that's my vision for where we need to go. In order to get there, though, there are things that have to be done with the airport. So, Buck, I know you want to talk a little bit about some of the projects you have going on. Do you have the ability to give me the mouse that's a good question. And I don't think I do with this, okay, well, but I'll point it I'll, out. I have I'll the walk, mouse right walk here. through this. So everything you see that's in color is basically kind of the plan that we have for the terminal. Um, the majority of this work will be done in about eight years um, at a cost of about 120 to $140 million. Um, We've got estimates. Um, we've began a design on phase one, which is all of the um, items that are circled. Um, I know the, if you look at the one that Jack's just circling, the baggage makeup area, that is what I call the non-sexy part of the terminal that probably no one really cares about except us at the airport. Um, that's where once your bags are screened, where the airlines go to grab them and put them on their their carts. As the planes have gotten bigger and we have more flights in the morning, that our room has become significantly um, undersized. Um, we have that room designed. Um, this was in our master plan, um, which was done before any design. And that room is already three times larger than just what's circled on there. So the actual design of that facility is, is much larger. Um, then we'll be moving to adding um, gates at gate two and gate five. So the ones that are circled. Um, jet bridge at gate three, we've decided not to do that. That's one of our smaller gates. And eventually when we add gates towards that gate six, and if we add a gate seven, gate three will probably go away and become more of um, food and beverage area. So we didn't want to put the money in the infrastructure at that gate. But um, I have leave it on this slide, but the next slide will show what we're doing at gate two. And we're able to add another door, another gate at gate two, which will give us the ability to add two jet bridges at gate two and give us some more flexibility. Um, right now, United boards two flights out of gate two at the same time every day. And it it's, it's just tight. It causes confusion. Um, we'll be able to add another gate, um, another gate podium, basically another door to the ramp to where we have some more flexibility and United could, could work two separate flights out of two different gates. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see we kind of plan on building, knocking the building out and we'll have two separate jet bridges that can go out um, to the parking spots. Um, gate five, adding gate five, adding these two jet bridges and then adding um, the baggage makeup is roughly a $23 million project. We're at 90% um, design now, and we're working towards getting that out to bid here shortly. There's some federal um, um, bipartisan infrastructure law money that's available for terminals, and we feel we will compete um, well for some of that funding. Um, so hopefully we will be out to bid, get some terminal funding, and start doing some of these kind of this phase one 
within the next um, 12 to 18 months, which would be a big relief from an operational standpoint, just to get the, the gates and the access that we need to serve our, our current capacity. And then we have a plan to add capacity um, in the next eight years that will really set the airport up for the future and, and all the flights that we expect to have um, moving forward. So I'm going to stop sharing, and that's um, that's pretty much our, our summary, I would say, of what's going on. And obviously, the planning ahead is can be so difficult because if you would go back um, 20 years, the forecast didn't envision the, the level of service that we have today. Um, and, and as Buck, you know, you're trying to plan 20 years into the future, and, and you know, on the current trajectory, we could be at that 40 departure a day number in in 20 years, and so. That, that gets to be very challenging, then figuring out ways to pay for it. When I think that's right. So when we did our master plan um, pre-COVID and we we lay out, we really dive into the terminal and, and what aircraft are we seeing. And we were seeing all majority of 50 seaters, an occasional 75 seat aircraft, and then a one-off Allegiant on, on a 737 Airbus or an MD-80. Well, then COVID happened. And now we don't see any more 50 seaters. We're all 75 seat. We have daily 737s and we have significantly more um, Allegiant and Avello flights now. And had we gone to the airlines when we were either doing our terminal, the original expansion six years ago, or um, our master plan and said, we think you're going to serve us with no 50 seaters, all 75 seat and all, all mainline, they would have laughed us out of the room and said, we're not paying for that. So we kind of got caught by, we expanded the terminal because we had to, but now the airlines have completely changed how they operate and it's really impacting our our terminal from a, a comfort of the passenger standpoint. You know, things are just tighter. They, it feels busier. There's lines that are bending around corners and, and we are working on it. We're aware of it. Um, we feel we have the answers. It's just going to take time to, to get that built. But again, the airlines have changed how they operate in the Detroit cities. And that's a great thing because like, like Jack was saying, the Walla Wallas, Yakmas, Wenatchees, they're, they're suffering with this change where we're excelling and it's just adapting and, and planning. And, you know, if, if Tridec was to say, Hey, this is the greatest airport in the world. We want to give them, you know, $30 million to do what they need to do. It still takes three years to build, you know, to go from here's the money to getting it built. So, um, planning appropriately is, is very important, and that's what we're really um, focused on is just planning and getting it right when we can do it instead of trying to piecemeal it and just do all these little things. We want to really do it right and uh, be able to handle the, the traffic we have today and tomorrow. That's, I mean, it's a good point. I think that's why you guys let me go with you when we go and call on airlines is try to give them some forevision of what we have coming locally. And, and even though our catchment area is a million people, um, I was just with Adam Lincoln, the city manager at Pasco yesterday, and and we were talking about some future um, you know, forecast models that would affect traffic flow or something. So he was telling me they, they're going through, I think, four subdivisions near the new high school in Pasco, 3,000 new homes projected, you know, full build out on the Broadmoor um, area, seven to 10,000 new homes. Um, you know, West Richland has 7,000 acres in the Lewis and Clark Ranch now that's going through a master planning thing that will eventually be kind of multi-use development, but it's all within the city limit boundaries. And so you can see like from a housing point of view, like where there's future people gonna live, those are those are data points always that we try to bring up to the airlines to try to help them work with us to try to get ahead, just like you guys said, of the curve so that we don't get caught in the pinch, whether it's facilities and infrastructure or size of planes or anything else. I mean, it's, it's hopefully the relationship that we have. And obviously, everybody's kind of knocking on their door trying to get new flights and stuff. But it, it always impresses me when, you know, we share the data that Jack puts together that shows how well we're doing. And it's just like you said before, Jack, it's such a great indicator of our economy and how well we're doing here in the Tri-Cities. And, and, and I'll let, I can let, important... oh, sorry, but I was gonna say, I can just... let Jack speak to this, but yeah. every airport does air service development differently. They they go with different 
contingencies of people to meet with the airlines. And, and I think from, from our standpoint, how we've always done it for years, and I think it works is you have the airport director who can talk about the operations of facility, you know, I can touch on the community and then you have, you know, the Carl with Tridec who can really dive into the nuts and bolts of the economy, which has always been an eye opener. When we talk about our economy to the airlines, they don't understand what all is going on here and how well our economy is and how diverse it really is. And then you have Jack who gets into the the weeds on the actual air service stuff. And it's, I think it's just a really good, well-rounded approach and it served us well. Um, so for me, when I talk to my other buddies of how they're doing air service, I always feel we kind of have an advantage um, when we go in on, on how we approach it. So um, the community yeah. can, can know that, we really do come with an A team when we go meet with these airlines and, and it's, yeah, it's awesome. I mean, I would underscore that and say in many, you know, I've been doing this a long time and in many communities, we don't have the support of the economic development corporation. We don't have the support of tourism. We don't have the support of the people we need at the table to explain what's going on. An airline planner, network planner, even in Alaska Airlines, they're dealing with about 140 markets. They don't deal with them every day, obviously. They're digging in mostly to what's going on in their hub cities. So Portland and Seattle and San Diego get a lot of attention in Alaska. We get even though we're near the near the headquarters, we don't get that much attention. And even though they're in Seattle, they don't have the detail that we have on what underpins the air service demand. And that's why having Tridec as a partner has helped us be successful probably more quickly than other markets is because the data that Carl, you present and the data that you dig up shows why the passengers are behaving the way they behave. And most people can't present that. And I think that's why, you know, it's really, it, it's it's a lot more fun to work in a market like this, where everybody works together and gets along. And despite the ribbing does, I think, do I think people like each other. <laughs> well, <laughs> which I is think it's also unknown. Like we always try to, you know, coordinate what we wear, just like we're a team. You know, we just project that team spirit. And it's just, we should have done better be team today. with you guys. Yeah. But hey, but, next time. Well, it, it's a good point. I'll, I mean, you know, I've done economic development in two other communities, and air service development is just night and day. Re realizing to your point, Jeb, Jack, that we're not a hub, we're a regional airport, but <clears throat> the growth that we have and stuff, um, we brought up our our partners. They are our partners in Yakima and Walla Walla, and and those communities based on their economy are in a different situation. You know, when it comes to air service, everybody wants air service. Everybody wants the convenience that we have here with the Tri-Cities Airport. But, you know, the economy and and people's income and all these other factors don't justify it. And to your point, Jack, it's, you can really tell a difference um, for that. You know, I started out in Sandpoint, Idaho, which is just a ski town. And they're like, oh, wouldn't it be great if we get some air service in here? And they tried to do it with unpressurized push planes <laughs> you know, with like flights to Boise and they were basically, you'd have to buy a block of tickets and, you know, it was an at risk. They didn't have any FAA support or anything else. And it was like an abject failure just because the economics of airline service, regardless of the plane size, don't work unless you're of a certain size. And, you know, there's this efficiency, uh, a scale that we continue to build on and grow that others don't have. So it's, it, and it, it kind of goes with the economy too, right? Like, People are going to move where the jobs are, and and we continue to add jobs in the Tri Cities. All of us working together, and other of our surrounding community continue to lose population. It's just it's the way that it's going. That's right. You know, to an airline, what we are selling is the opportunity to generate revenue. And how does an airline generate revenue? Well, through selling tickets. But you need to sell so many of them in this day and age in order to break even because costs have increased. I mean, pilots are making much more than they've ever made. Flight attendants are getting new contracts. Yeah. Um, their wages were far too low for too long. So it's well-deserved that they're getting raises. Um, but what that's done is put pressure on those hours that are being you know, spent 
by the carrier to generate more revenue. And that's why we have 737s, because we can put 159 people on there instead of 76. But you have to have the underlying demand. And so explaining the underlying demand is key to everything that we do. That uh, You bring up a good point. I was thinking of one of our previous conversations, Jack, that when we increase the size of the plane like we're doing where we get more of the main lines of 737s or or airbuses i think with delta's flying maybe into salt lake in the morning from a re remain overnight but um so we get more seats but then there's fewer flights and the i think you had brought up before that that fewer flights like if you can on alaska if you can only fly to alaska and i'm just going to make a number up you know four times a day instead of five times a day because we're flying different planes does that affect that catchment area too? Like like losing the the number of flights, even though there's more seats, affect when people make a choice of do I drive to Seattle or do I get on the airplane to Pasco? Is that part of the factor too? Certainly it can. It really comes down to how the flights are scheduled in terms of what they hit at the hub. So our flights, well, we we have um we, we still have between five and six flights a day to Seattle. So um at the peak, I think with the Q400, we had nine flights a day, something like that. So um, yeah, we've lost a number of frequencies, but we actually have more seats going there. They're yeah. timed to connect into the largest group of connecting flights. So as long as they are well-timed, then you're okay. The challenge is a, a, a community like Yakima, not to pick on them, but with their two flights, they have one outbound and one inbound that are really well timed and then they have their other flight that's really poorly timed and that's always if you have to sit in seattle and you're in you live in yakima you have to sit in seattle for four hours uh, to wait for your next flight you're probably going to drive yeah. um, isolation is our friend because the drive is harder to seattle um, but we've been it, one of the things we look at pretty consistently, we actually do it on a monthly basis as we come through the schedule to make sure our timings are good. Um, and I'm just about to send Buck our schedule for the next month. Um, and we make sure that the connections are right because if they're not, we can quickly ping the airline uh, schedulers yeah. and see if we can get changes made. Uh, we're lucky that we've kept enough frequency that it really hasn't been a problem. But if you go to say one flight a day in a market, it can be hard. Yeah. It can be really hard to get the right connections. Yeah. Buck, let's go to you. Uh, we spoke earlier about this innovative solution to an environmental challenge that you had at the airport regarding the icing fluid. Could you give us an update on how that project's going and, and you know, how the worms are doing? Yeah. So um, when the aircraft de-ice, they use um, propylene glycol, and we would store it and then discharge it into the city's um, wastewater facility. Um, there was a couple times where that discharge upset the plant, and the, the city had to, to recover that plant. And there's, there's regulations, and this is more on the city side of what they need to do to meet the, the demands of ecology in that plant. But they, they asked us if we could not use their plant anymore. And it, it was, it was very respectful. It was, you know, if we yeah, needed yeah. to, they would work with us. And we looked at different options of trucking it, of you can spray it on fields. You can use it as dust control. There's a lot of different things yeah. we could have done. And um, Stephen McFadden, who happens to be on this call, I don't know, he and I just sit in his office sometime and chat about whatever. And he was bringing up um, this wastewater, um, processed water from, you know, some food plant um, using this new technology biofiltro for using worms to to basically clean the waste and, and discharge it. And I, we left and I didn't think, and then I came back, I don't know, maybe a week, two, a month later. And I'm like, do you think this would work on the glycol? And, and he's like, I don't know. And then he called out to biofilter and they're like, we don't know. And we set up a meeting and um, they got a sample, took it to the lab and they're like, we think this can work. And um, we've been doing a pilot program, um, had some challenges at first, but once you kind of see how it goes, you adjust everything. And now it's, it's um, appears to be very successful. 
we're extending the pilot program through this um, de-icing season to just get kind of two years of um, data under our belt. Um, but what it does is the, the, the waste is pumped into a, a holding tank that has worms and it's sprayed over the worms. The worms then eat the dirt and the, the wood chips and that are wet and they basically digest the glycol and basically clean it out all the toxins, all the, and turn it into water that can be discharged um, safely. And um, wow. we're getting ready to reach out to ecology because we're at the point where we have enough water we'd like to start discharging. So we're going to start chatting with ecology and getting, making sure we get the thumbs up. And that's kind of the next step in the process. And if this works, um, we have, um, we'll probably put a project in to add an official kind of plant, um, permanent plant versus the mobile truck that we have now. And that will become our new way of discharging um, the glycol waste. So pretty exciting, um, kind of forced to look at things differently at times when things change. And um, we still think this is a much more cost-effective and environmentally friendly option than yeah. Um, we could now tie into the city's new, um, um, I think it's processed water reuse facility or whatever the, yep. the yep. new thing is called. Um, just connecting to that plant, we think this is probably still going to be a more cost effective option for the airport. And it's a little, yeah. I don't know if it's more environmentally friendly than that plant, but it's a its a very good um, process and we're excited yeah. to, to hopefully turn it on full full blast. No, that's awesome. I, I think I'm not the expert on it, but I think that, you know, you're so far away from the water reuse facility. It, if you can treat it on site and especially if they would let you, you know, land apply it or something on site for irrigation or something, that would be amazing. That I, I think that's, that's great. I mean, that's kind of another result of growth, right? Which are, are good things, but you have more planes that need to be iced. You develop a little more fluid. There's that pressure on the cities. Um, you know, sanitary sewer system and coming up with innovation solutions. That's, I think it's really cool. Well, and, and talking with, we meet, I meet with our airline managers quite often and we kind of laugh, but it's like, we're starting to have big boy problems, trying to figure out where to park planes, how to handle the growth. You know, we're adding parking spots. It's just issues we're having with the growth now. And th those are great problems to have. Yeah. You don't, it's like, you don't ever want to have problems, but if you have problems, it's better to be, how do we deal with this growth and how do we deal with this retraction? You yeah. know, which side of the terminal do we close off? Those aren't the yeah. problems we're having, which is a good, good thing. Well, I think it's only right that you're having these big boy problems since, you know, in reality, um, commercial air service, starting with commercial air mail service started here in Pasco in 1926, right? Yep. Yeah. Only for almost a hundred years, and and I would, I would also point out that most of the phone calls that my company gets are from airports that are very much on the other side of things. Where, a hundred and thirty-one airports have lost at least one airline since the beginning of twenty twenty. Hundred and thirty-one wow. airports in the wow. U.S. That that's a ton. There's there's about four hundred that have service. So, um, essentially, uh, more than a quarter of airports have lost at least one airline. So most of the phone calls we get are, uh-oh, we're in trouble. We need to recruit more service now. And when you've already started the backslide, it is so hard to halt it, almost impossible. So the way that we have been proactive has resulted in some of the problems that have, have come up. But as Buck says, much better to have this problem than any other kind of problem with an airport. Yeah, yeah. Maybe take, take a minute, Jack. I was going to talk to you about some emerging airline trends. You're always our, you know, trusted source for um, insights into airlines. But I was even just hearing this morning on the radio that Southwest is making a move to you actually get to select your seat. And uh, you want to give us some insight on that and then anything else that you see coming up just from a airline perspective. Obviously, you talked about the challenge with planes and pilots and those things. But what else is going on, you know, from the carrier side? 
Yeah, I mean, the model for airline services changed so much and what the, the big guys have done so incredibly well, and by that I mean basically United, Delta, American, Alaska, is competing on the lower end with the low cost carriers with that basic economy offering, right? Where you get your seat at, at the gate or when you check in, you get no carry on, that kind of thing. And so they've skimmed away a lot of passengers from other carriers, Southwest being one of them. Uh also, people, how how things have changed since the pandemic, people have a different expectation of the services they want. They want to be able to pick their seat. They, they aren't willing to risk it anymore. And Southwest, their model was built that way so that they could turn planes real quickly. It's real easy when you don't have seat assignments because people just take whatever seat and the boarding goes quick. With the size of the planes today, you can't turn a plane in 30 minutes anyway. So there, that benefit had gone away for Southwest and they had done a lot of market research over the last several years asking their own customers, do you want to sign seats? And overwhelming number over 80% said, yeah. So Southwest yesterday announced uh, starting next year, we don't have a date yet. You will be able to purchase a seat assignment. Also, airlines have done a great job segmenting passenger population by that I mean you have your you should just have maybe first class and then all coach was the same or you would just have all coach on the plane now we have these premium economy offerings and there's two different kinds you can have a premium and then an economy extra leg room and so they've segmented the customer into all these different positions and they've made a lot of money doing it if you're an elite on any airline you'll notice upgrade rates have absolutely plummeted because the airlines have figured out how to sell those seats up front um what southwest was challenged with is they had no premium seat at all. All the seats are exactly the same. So yeah. they're losing out on revenue and their profits are declining while United and Delta in particular are just best profitability in the world. Yeah. So Southwest is gonna have an extra leg room section now where you can pay extra to have the, you know, that 37 inches of, of pitch instead of 32. Sure. So that they can generate revenue. Now the bags are still going to be free on Southwest, two bags for free. But if you look at how airlines make money, a, a relatively small proportion is from the fare you pay. Uh, like on Allegiant, the fare is a third of the money they make from you. Two thirds is from bags, seat assignments, extra leg room. They've all figured out how to do that. Yeah. And so Southwest has got to change its model in order to compete. Uh, that's interesting. I, you know, from their perspective, obviously it'll help them increase their revenue and do some of those other things. But like that was always, like you say, the quick turnaround time and the pick your own seat. That was always kind of like their marketing niche. So it'll just be interesting to see the way that they market this. And of course, it really doesn't apply to us because you know, we don't have Southwest and we're doing great without them. And, you know, we don't even care about those other lines that don't fly to Pasco, right, Bob? Yeah, I mean, I could look at some data and tell you how many people actually use Southwest from Pasco if you if you want to know. That's okay. I don't, yeah, I don't know if, if that's something you want to know, but now I'm curious, so I'm going to look at it anyway. <laughs> um, I'll tell you in a second or two, but oh, so no we have... On average, you, 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 this is going to surprise you guys, 274 people a day from the Tri-Cities area fly southwest, 94 of them from Seattle, and 129 of them from Spokane. So we do have a lot of people that drive out to get on southwest. So these changes, it will be interesting to see if these changes have yeah. an impact on that number. Well, and it, I mean, just even like the folks that may like, let's say, live in Yakima and then drive to Seattle and they could have driven to Tri-Cities. Um, it's almost like they're, you know, you, you need to lay out the economics of it, right? So how much is your gas going to cost? Is the weather good? What's that trip like? You know, if if parking's the same, I think our I would assume our parking's better than Their Seattle. Park, actually, Yakima's parking is more expensive than ours. Yeah. So, so like when you actually calculated all these things out, like they just look at the ticket price and they go, Oh, I'll just drive to Spokane or something. But it's like, yeah, you're leaving a lot of the other costs off. You know I mean? You're not really understanding the true cost of it. So to, to be could... fair, I will, you know, where it makes sense and I'm, I, I'm not selling this, but your family of five or 
six, that $200 or $150 a ticket makes a big difference. Yeah. If you're flying solo, it, I don't think it pencils out, but mm-hmm. um, I'm really interested to see, I think next year, once LAX gets going and we get some data, we're going to do another leakage study. Um, I'm interested to see on the the increase in leakage to Spokane, where that comes from in our market. If it's coming out of like Moses Lake or if it's coming out of yeah. Tri-Cities proper, that'll be interesting to see. Um, and I'm also interested in how, because I I think we're getting more people from Yakima coming to the Tri-Cities. I'm interested to see if that if our marketing is actually paying off. So that would be yeah. a good study to say, yeah, hey, our marketing is is paying off and our leakage to Spokane is now more the northern part versus people in the Tri-Cities driving up to go fly southwest. It's Moses Lake, you know, that northern part of our catchment area just going because it's closer or it's halfway and they can get a cheaper ticket. Yeah. So. Well, you know, other states like Montana and Idaho, they have to put their county on the license plate. If we had that in Washington, Buck, you could just be out there in the parking lot, yeah, taking numbers and just doing yeah. your calculations. Man. Although, so we we try to do that in a couple of other places, and the data always is skewed because people who live near the airport get dropped off oh, and they don't sure. park, and people who yeah. live far away park there. So That's it always looks like our origin is way out here. Right. Really, it's just That's people getting point. dropped off or taken yeah. on Uber or something. Yeah. Uh, we're down to four minutes. Buck, anything else that we want to talk about today? No, I mean, the, the biggest thing for me is to let the community know that we are working hard to, to get new service and to ensure that we continue to provide the community with an excellent option Um coming to and leaving the Tri-Cities. Um, we know we're the, we're the front and back door to our community. We're the first thing a lot of people see when they come. We're the last thing they see when they leave. So we always strive to provide a good customer experience. And um, I know things are getting tight in the terminal now, and we, we have a plan. It's just going to take time to, to get this plan in play. But we're, we're working on it. We're continuously working, we're hard, working hard to ensure we sure. have... Um, a good experience for, for those using our airport. Well, I said it before, but I, I mean, and I, it's the truth. I'm not just trying to, to be nice or anything, but I, and, and I don't even think it's because you guys have included me in our airport service team and stuff. But I, as you said that book, I just thought about like when I come home and it's 11 o'clock at night or something and, or when I leave in the morning and I and I see the folks that work there, whether they work directly for you or like like I said, TSA, like I I think I don't know how you did it, but like I think we have the friendliest TSA agents I've ever met. But there's I I feel a sense of pride. Like I think the airport, to your point, is a such a good representation of our community. It's it's welcoming, it's the right size, it it, you know, it really um projects that image that we want to for visitors and, you know, for people here in the community. I mean, you guys are doing a great job. Thank you. Jack, two minutes. Uh, what do you got for us? Well, I would underscore that. I mean, Tri cities, the, the whole community is so lucky to have the, the airport that is there because so many other communities would be so envious of uh, not only the service that's available, but the way the airport operates. Right. It, it, it because it's very efficient. Um, and Buck, I'm never going to say anything this nice to you again, but uh, it's just it, it, it's operating better than peers. Um, and for for me, the big thing is, please use this LAX service. Please use the second Phoenix. Yeah. Please use these flights, because the more you're using these flights, the easier it is for the three of us to go and get more flights. Yeah. That is the key to Everything we do is please always check Tri Cities first, PSC first, please, please, because that is how we continue to grow. Um, no, that's well said, uh, Buck and Jack. It's always great to be with you guys. I, I, you know, that time that we did fly that first available flight down to Burbank, and we did squeeze into the front row. That was, it was fun, and you know, even when we kind of did that special coffee with Carl. Uh, episode from the airport it, it's always great traveling with you guys you're both professionals in your field do a great job and really appreciate you letting me be a part of your team 
Um, for all, everybody joining us, thanks thanks for your time today. And do want to encourage everybody to get out this weekend. It's Waterfallers weekend. Hit the boat races. Uh, we've got some great local sponsorship with Apollo now supporting the water follies and some local teams that are out there. So go out and support our local teams in the boat races and everybody have a great weekend. Bucket Jeff. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.